Okay, uh, as Steen said, my name is uh, Jesper Saxgren and I uh, used to lecture here about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, since I have been employed as an external examinator and right now I'm a supervisor for, for dissertations in sustainable architecture and building construction. But besides, I, I mainly work uh, with uh, consultancy work in uh, third world countries, in uh, Nepal, in Ghana, in Bolivia. And uh, this part of my work will also be reflected in my presentation. Uh, I have called my presentation Sustainable Integrative and Place-Based Design and this very first picture is literally and truly, maybe you could say, a hardcore example of place-based design, which is integrative and sustainable. It's a construction, it's an iglo. It's a construction which actually grows out of the landscape, so to speak, and is a part of the landscape. It's built from the only material which is available there, which is snow. It is built without beams and poles. It's a self-containing construction, a dome construction, because there are no uh, uh, timber or anything for other kinds of constructions. And it also sort of reflects the very landscape and it's, an, uh, uh, a sustainable construction in that way that when it's abandoned it will return into the landscape it will come back in and it can be replicated over and over again without harming the environment. Uh, this presentation you might find that some of the slides I'll show you and some of my, the points I'll be making might be a little far away from what you are sitting with uh, in, 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 uh, in your own work here, in your study at the school. But uh, my ambition is to try to give you some new pictures. I mean, Design is about approach, it's about choices. And architecture and building construction is not a neutral pro profession. The choices you make can have enormous impact, positively or negatively. And therefore, your profession is definitely not neutral. And therefore, I would like to Maybe to challenge your approach and maybe to uh, widen the perspectives of that approach and trying to show you, as I said, that no choice is neutral. For example, if you, if you just as an example, if you choose to build a flat roof because of aesthetic reasons, for example, it's not a neutral choice it definitely has implications, which you have to be responsible for. If you choose in this kind of climate to make a flat roof, then you definitely also need to invent a 100% waterproof membrane, because otherwise it won't function in this kind of climate. If you choose to design a flat roof, then you definitely also need to, to install mechanical ventilation because otherwise you cannot ventilate your rooms because it's not, the ventilation is not integrated as part of the very structure. So therefore there are no neutral cho choices and therefore it's, I think it's interesting also to sort of widen the perspective and understanding that when we sit with a piece of paper on just a building ground, it has implications in all directions. And we have also to think about these implications, these consequences, and bring them in to the very considerations of our designs. So 
no building, no construction can be seen and function in isolation from its location. We cannot just build a building and then leave it there. It has implications in the very construction phase, in the functioning phase, and uh, later on also when it has to be demolished. And all these uh, 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 implications we need to bring in to the very understanding of what we're doing. Traditionally, architecture was a reflection of place and climate, an integration of architecture into nature and nature into architecture. And I will just give you like a few examples of, of uh, where it's very evident and what uh, might be seen, uh, where, where you might say, oh, this is far away from what we're doing, but please try and see it as images, as uh, approaches to what I'm talking about. <clears throat> For example, this construction is from Lesø, an island uh, out here in Kattegat. And as you see, the roofs, they are built out of the material which was there in, in a, a big abundance. There were plenty of that delivered every day at the shores of, of, of Lesø. And then, therefore, it was actually used for uh, the constructions. At the same time, they didn't have a lot of timber, so it's also just like a timber frame with, with infill of, of, of possibly clay stones. Another example of place-based design is from Iceland. It could also be the Faroe Islands. Here again you see, I mean, this is not a place where you have a lot of uh, available mater building materials like uh, timber, for example. So this is built out of the rocks and then the actual turf, the actual uh, soil of the area. And as you can also see, I mean, it also reflects the very climate there. You can see in this construction that is, it's definitely, without knowing anything, that this is not a hot and humid climate. Which on, this is a cold climate where you try to sort of hide yourself, put yourself very good, uh, protected into the very landscape. But now here, also maybe without knowing where we are, this is uh, from Malaysia, where you see another construction. This is an open, light construction where the wind can come in uh, very easily, ventilate the room because we are in the humid tropics. At the same time, you see very steep roofs because they should also <laughs> be able to uh, lead uh, the heavy rain when it comes so as, not like before, they don't need to invent this 100% waterproof membrane, which I talked about before. So they, it's shaped in that way so that the water can run off easily. At the same time, you have these big eaves, so it also gives shady protection. Here is another example pretty close to the example of the Iglo, so to speak. It's from the Arizona desert, where the traditional Navajo Hogans are built of the very soil which is there. They also have to choose this dome construction because there, there are no timber there. There are no timber for, for, for making a construction like that, so they have to make this dome-shaped construction. And it's made out of the very soil of that area and it also actually uh, in the upper uh, picture you can hardly tell the difference between the rock and, 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 and the building. Here is an example from one of a very very hot place, the Iranian uh, desert, the old Persian wind towers this is before AC, ladies and gentlemen. This is before we could just uh, put on the, the mechanical ventilation and cool down our houses. These people have to invent uh, 
living conditions and indoor climates without the use of fossil fuels to, to cool the houses. So they invented these ventilation towers, which were actually connected also to underground uh, um, uh, uh, tubes or whatever you call it, so that they could actually, they, because of differences in pressure, they draw, they draw in fresh air in the bottom and, and let out uh, the hot air in, 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 in the chimneys making actually a very comfortable uh, uh, setting uh, only by the way they construct. Here's an example from southern China where you see the buildings are very, very well integrated into the landscape. They almost reflect the landscape. They are communal uh, residences. These, uh, in, in these uh, constructions, many families are living uh, in this sort of closed in structure. Of course, one of the reasons for this structure is also protective reasons because when, when they, uh, they, were, they probably had to protect themselves for, for possible attacks and so on, but it was also a very uh, good construction in that sense that in, in, in winter time it could also be, be uh, nice and, 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 and warm in between there. And finally here from Galicia in, in Spain, without knowing also the climate there, you can probably guess uh, with good uh, evidence that there would probably some, be some pretty cold winter storms because they all, almost pull the roof over the shoulder and really sort of sets into the landscape trying to minimize the heat loss and, and trying to uh, make a more uh, uh, comfortable uh, indoor climate. And here from the Titicaca Lake in South America, uh, in Bolivia, here they, these people are actually not only building their houses from the reeds which are growing in the, uh, around the lake, they're actually also building the very foundation of, of their, their, their livelihoods of where they're living. They, these are actually floating islands. And then they just put, uh, when they uh, uh, deteriorate, when they uh, decompose underneath, they just continuously fill more and more reeds, more and more straw on top. And, and there you see also this single material is reflected in everything they do, in the very construction of the houses, even in, in, in the boats they, they use to, to sail uh, the lake. And this, this was just like some examples of what you could call vernacular architecture, where the very constructions, the very designs are very well integrated into the location, into the place, and they are really uh, in dialogue, so to speak, with the surroundings, with the landscape, with the climate, because they sort of, it's built before we begin to use fossil fuels for, for solving all kinds of problems. That was before that time when we sort of tried to take the most benefit the most advantage of the so-called free conditions. I mean, exposure to sun or uh, uh, leaf from wind or whatever it was. I mean, that we could use all the free uh, utilities which are actually there by just thinking wisely before we construct. This I will call uniformity of no place. I mean, when you travel around the world, you see these kind of constructions everywhere now. Uh, you, you cannot tell the difference any longer if you go in the cities almost, if you are in Asia and if you are in Africa and if you're in South America and you're in Western Europe, wherever you are, it's the same. And uh, uh, these, these constructions, they do not reflect the place any longer. They sort of uh, are, are 
trying to solve the, the, the problems which we solve in different way, uh, in, 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 diff in a different way. And today, more than 50% of the world population are living in cities. More than 50% of the world's population today are living in cities, meaning that also cities are occupying more and more land. Therefore, it's also very important that we also look into how we construct in the cities, and I'll come back to that at the very end. But these, these detached constructions these modern constructions, which are supposed to be very, very uh, smart and so on, in my opinion, they are not very smart because they cannot function without input, heavy inputs of energy. I mean, they cannot function without uh, air condition in, in every room. They cannot uh, function without uh, a lot of fossil fuels bo uh, used for, for the, the actual constructions for the production of materials and everything. So they are totally dependent on constant input on fossil fuels. Uh, and they are exporting uh, their problems, so to speak, either to nature or to common generations, in that sense that they do not take care of, 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 of uh, or they do not consider what are the implications of this kind of constructions in the very construction phase, but also in, in the running phase. What are the implications? I mean, no, no, as I said before, no building is neutral. It, it has uh, a connection to, the, uh, to the, the surroundings, to the environment. And there is a material flow. There is no closed circles. There is a material flow. There is an energy flow. There is uh, constantly a like from source to sink, there's no really taking care of, of uh, all the, the, uh, the things they are dealing with. For example, also waste, wastewater, uh, the dependency on fossil fuels where we are reaching peak oil uh, and oil in the future will become uh, less and less. Uh, then how, how will we run these kind of constructions, these kind of cities in the future? So, uh, and I said before, I mean, uh, if we look at, at buildings I I as such, they consume approximately 40% of all energy produced. They consume, uh, consume approximately 40% of all material resources, and they generate approximately 40% of all the solid waste stream. So, as I said in the very beginning of my presentation, Building construction has heavy impact. I mean, it really, really means a lot the decisions we make for now and also for, for, for future generations. We cannot continue with these kind of figures. This is impossible. These figures are not sustainable. And, and the very, uh, the, the, the very um, evidence is right next to it because we live on a limited planet. We don't have unlimited resources. The resources on a limited planet are limited. And that's why nature invented uh, 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 cycles. Because we would not be here if nature hadn't invented cycles. Because what we are made of is the very same material which our forefathers and even the dinosaurs and before that were made of. Because Everything is built up and then it's taken apart again into the same building uh, elements and rebuilt again. So we cannot continue with this kind of uh, consume. Therefore, we definitely need to, to, uh, to change. We definitely need to invent other ways of of constructing other ways of designing, which are more in balance with the limitations of nature, which are more in balance with nature, 
And as shown in, in this uh, drawing to the right, I mean, we need to close the circles so that everything we do can come into a circle and not become a dead end, where we only try to minimize the, the consummation or we only try to minimize the, the damage. Some of you were here maybe uh, half a year ago where we had invited uh, uh, Baumgart, Michael Baumgart, who is one of the responsible fathers for the concept of cradle to cradle. I mean, we are not any longer talking about cradle to grave. No, we have to talk about cradle to cradle because like in nature, everything uh, is reused. There's no grave, so to speak, in nature. There's no waste in nature. Waste is always reused and becomes uh, an input for a new process. <clears throat> yeah, well, that was just what I uh, explained, that we have to invent this kind of, of new uh, approach. And we are in a situation now where we cannot where it's not enough just to talk about sustainable design. We actually need to so talk about sustainable and regenerative design because we have destroyed so much. We have taken down so much forest, for example, that we really need to regenerate the ecosystems, which we are totally dependent on. I mean, we cannot live if the ecosystems uh, uh, fall apart because we are totally dependent on their deliveries, not only in form of, of building materials, but also in form of oxygen, also in form of that they are taking care of our, our waste, they are handling our wastewater, they are purifying uh, the, the, the water we pollute and so on. So we cannot live isolated from, uh, from nature. We cannot live without also uh, trying to make sure that these ecosystem services are in place because otherwise uh, the human habitats cannot function either. So the, the, uh, and the design process, uh, we have to sort of also uh, make that as a continued process where we, where we observe, we observe the landscape, we observe the locality, we observe the climate, we observe uh, where are we going to build? Then we reflect what are the, the, the main features here, the main patterns here, what, are the, what will we obtain and so on. Then we design and then we implement, but then we do not stop. Then we have to observe again, did our implementation, did our design <coughs> fulfill what we were set out to achieve? If not, then we have to reflect again and redesign and so on. So it's a conti continuous process. Okay, uh, now I'll try to uh, give you uh, a few examples of what I mean with regenerative design and integrative place-based sustainable design. This is from a project which uh, we are doing in Nepal. And uh, the situation in Nepal is uh, deforestation, heavy deforestation at the mountain sides. Uh, because of that, heavy erosions, which is causing flooding when the monsoon comes and there is no protecting uh, layer of forest to, to protect the heavy rains, then it washes the topsoil out into the riverbeds, causing flooding downstream, and there is a loss of arable land due to that. You can see this bridge. This was supposed to be a bridge crossing a river, and it was torn apart by, by these heavy flash floods, which comes every year. And on the second picture, you can see a small village there, uh, which is really, really threatened by by the river, because this is the riverbed, how it widens out and digging. It takes more and more of the arable land. It begins to take people's houses also, because we are, uh, we are not making sure that 
the ecosystem which they are a part of is, is healthy, as in, in, in good shape. So, to try to address this, we are constructing, or we have constructed a, a training and demonstration center in, uh, within the watershed where we are working, and to, uh, to demonstrate uh, new building techniques which can help uh, to solve some of these problems. Traditionally, people in Nepal use burnt bricks. And if you fly into Kathmandu, you can see, I've never ever, nowhere else in the world seen so many brick factories. They are, there are hundreds around Kathmandu. And, and, and uh, traditionally, there were forests there, but all that forest went in, into the, the burning of the bricks. And, and therefore, I mean, we need to, uh, we use bamboo for construction instead. And the added effect of that, that is the regenerative approach, is that by using bamboo, we, uh, we also plant it for erosion control. It's the fastest growing plant in the world. Uh, it can grow up to, uh, to usable size in, in three to four years. Uh, but at the same time, it's very, very good for erosion protection. Riverbank protection, we plant it along the riverside so that, that uh, the river do not dig in and, and, and take more land. It's, uh, in that sense, it's part of reforestation. It increases the biodiversity, which is also important for, for the ecosystems. And it also helps in carbon sequestration. I mean, you know, when we talk about we let out too much CO2, we need to bind some of the CO2 again. Uh, we use compressed earth blocks uh, instead of these burnt bricks. That is just using the very soil which is there and in a, in a manual process, uh, uh, we, we, we pr press them and I'll show you uh, how they look like. Uh, this reduces uh, the need for, for uh, firewood or coal or oil or whatever to burn the bricks. And in that sense, it is also reducing the CO2 emissions. We uh, construct uh, with natural ventilation. It's a very, in summer, it's very hot down there, 40, 45 degrees. So it's definitely a, a hot climate where we would like to, to have like uh, a cool indoor climate. And therefore we, uh, we integrate natural ventilations in the very uh, form and construction of the buildings. Uh, so there is no energy in need for, uh, for air condition. We use biogas toilets in that sense that we produce uh, a clean energy which can be used in, in the uh, kitchen to cook the food. Uh, and we are utilizing a resource, which is actually the excrement. It's a resource like cow dung or whatever. The human excrement is also a resource which has to be recirculated. And finally, we also do rainwater harvesting. <clears throat> and in that sense, help in water conservation. We uh, utilize it in form of a fish pond so that we can uh, give uh, people more uh, options to, uh, for their livelihoods and it also helps increase biodiversity. <coughs> uh, this is uh, just to show you how we, we use bamboo constructively. I mean, these, these constructions here is raised only in bamboo. And, 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 and bamboo uh, compared uh, size to size is as strong as steel. So it's a matter of how we, 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 we use the, uh, the bamboo in, uh, in the concern. Of course, we cannot use it like a full-grown uh, bamboo. It, it will bend. But I mean, built up in this kind of construction, it, it, uh, it uh, really functions. And you see, we actually we erect a big hall. I call it like a cathedral because I think it, it, it looks almost like a, like a cathedral. This is pure uh, bamboo construction. The construction uh, to the left there is an adobe, I mean, where we use only sunburned bricks and, and, and not compressed earth blocks. <clears throat> uh, 
The compressed earth blocks, as I said, is made directly from the soil, the clay soil, which is available there. We, we use like a, a hydraulic machine like this just uh, to, to produce them. And all the, uh, all the bricks which we have used for this construction is produced locally as an integrated training also where we train the local people to, uh, con to produce these uh, bricks. And, and if they are, uh, they are improved with, with uh, seven, five, seven percent of cement, but, uh, uh, and if they are well protected, they are maybe not as durable as burnt bricks, but, but if they are well protected, they can uh, last for many, many years. And as you see there, one of the chimneys from the, the brick factories. Uh, And also, I mean, we, the, the tiles are also produced there. They are micro cement tiles, uh, I mean, produced on the site with only small amount uh, of, uh, of cement in, uh, in, a, uh, in a mold, uh, a form, where, which is made by uh, the local people too. And, and you see also how the uh, bamboo is used there. As I said, natural ventilation is integrated into the very construction uh, where you see, for example, in, in the two stories construction there where we have a heavy uh, first uh, or, or bottom uh, floor with, uh, with rammed earth walls, which is a big thermal mass which can absorb a lot of heat and <coughs> gives a very nice and cool indoor climate. And then we have like uh, a ventilation chimney on top, which is connected to the bottom floor also. And the first floor is, is a light, uh, open uh, uh, bamboo construction. And here you see also how the, uh, the uh, ventilation uh, is integrated into the building. I was, we were sitting in there having a meeting uh, just uh, three weeks ago, and it was 38 degrees outside. Uh, and you could sit there actually feel how it was functioning. There was a, 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 a nice slow breeze which uh, sort of came in and, and was ventilated out through the, the openings in the roof. Normally you know you put these fans up in the ceiling and that's where the hot air rises by itself so every time the hot air gets up there then the fan pulls it down because there's no no outlet in, in traditional buildings. We had to let, if, if we are in such time, type of climate, we had to give the air the possibility, uh, the hot air to the possibility to leave. Then, as I said, we use the, we have the toilets uh, put on a biogas system. And as you see there, uh, we, we take the biogas directly into the kitchen and cantina uh, to use for cooking. So therefore, every time the people have been to, to, to the cantina, they have to go to the toilet and pay back. The, and, and also we, we put into the very contract of all the employees that they are not allowed to, to visit the toilet at home. They have to wait until they come to the center because we understand it's otherwise they will not be able to have their food at least cooked. Well, that's, that's a, of course a joke. Uh, and finally, uh, we, we use the, uh, in, in these areas, uh, the rain comes in short periods in the rainy season and it comes very heavy, heavily and then you have a long dry season. So if you don't uh, sort of integrate construction which can, can uh, retain, can, uh, can keep the water while it's there, then, then you lose it uh, by, by runoff. So therefore we also make these uh, pond construction which can collect the rainwater while it's there and then uh, prolong the accessibility for water also into the dry season. And of course we can then also uh, stock it with, uh, with, with fish, adding to uh, the possibilities for li people's livelihoods. Finally, as I said in the beginning, we cannot only talk about 
the countryside, the rural areas, we definitely also need to address the cities because cities, uh, people uh, on a world, uh, on a global scale, more than 50% of the people lives in cities now and cities are still spreading. So therefore we need also to find ways of greening the city or greening the concrete desert, so to speak. And this, these are examples of that. Uh, this, this building here is actually like uh, an oasis in, in this concrete city desert. This is the Fukuoka uh, building from Japan. Uh, the other one you might know is, uh, is the Norman Foster's uh, tower from London. So, I mean, there are, of course, also now attempts to try to also bring these kind of approaches into the very design of, of the cities, in the very design of the habitats which are, are covering most of the planet Earth at this time. And therefore, I hope that uh, this presentation uh, had helped you in, in maybe giving you some new perspective, having, uh, maybe have challenged uh, a few of your approaches, and I hope that it was at least uh, to some inspiration for you. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.